and gold had 11 years up, you know, in a row. Mm -hmm. And silver outperformed gold most of those years. It had some off years, in other words, one year over year like gold was, but it did well, very well. You know, when we met, if you would have asked me that we're going to go through this long U formation, meaning from the top all the way down, 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 finally hit a bottom after years, then blah, 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 and get all the way back to what's called a round trip, where it goes back around the top of 2000, and it's going to take till, you know, 2023 to do so. The fundamentals for gold is, have only gotten better. I called the run to gold months ago, and I'll believe I'll be vindicated. Not that it's about me, it's the message, not the messenger. But the idea is that that the smart money gets back in the gold soon, relatively soon. And the central banks bought more gold in 2022 than they had in decades. And that's the smart money. And even though they poo-poo gold on CNBC and the main financial channels, and they only seem to feature a gold feature when gold is down, the truth of the matter is that gold does well <clears throat> for preserving your wealth. And I'm gonna digress for a minute, but Edda, they would be better off. Now, I have to be fair, that's from roughly the bottom to now. But if you measure from the bottom to now, stocks, bonds, and gold, gold is outperformed everything. So now has it outperformed a certain stock? No, but it's outperformed the index. Gold has outperformed the S&P 500. It's outperformed the bond index. So back to you, Kerry. But, you know, gold, I, I just want to go on a minute more. You know, especially early on, he's like, oh, he's only a gold bug. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But if you stealthily ask the question of one of these radio hosts, especially the mainstream, that are kind of undereducated about precious metals. So if I could give you an investment that had a compounded annual growth rate of 10% per year, year, would you be interested in? And of course the host would say yes. So well, the one that's done that's gold. Name me another one that's done a compounded, compounded annual growth rate of 10%. And they wouldn't be able to come up with it. I would say what that gold is very undervalued relative to the monies. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at what's the paper price of gold, it's a very easy equation. I put it out. One of my first internet articles is still floating out there in cyberspace somewhere called Engineering the Price of Gold. And you take what the Austrians call base money or true money supply, which is M0. So that's the amount of paper. So that's you put that in the numerator. Then you take the amount of gold uh, and you divide it. <clears throat> that's the denominator. And if you do that division problem, you come out with $14,000 an ounce, which is the high price that you do. So that's at 2000 now. So from that metric, it's seven times undervalued. And the reason I say that is you go back into history, you'll see where that metric worked. In other words, as Mike Maloney says, gold catches up and does a financial accounting for all the bad printing that's gone on for years. Yeah. Ago. It did it in 1980. If you do that same math, it's really arithmetic. It's division. If you do that in 1980, what you'll find was that the paper price of gold was $400 an ounce. Yet it peaked at eight 50 in the spot market January 21st, 1980, which is over double the theoretical true gold price. And we could have gone back on a gold standard. So that was nine years from the time Nixon closed the gold window. And you would have been able to peg the price of the gold at, let's say, 800 and been well above the, the requirement for a paper price of gold. You would have twice as much. You could think of it in two, one of, think of it several ways. Mainly say, well, we have twice as much gold as we need to meet our obligations because really for 400 is the you know paper price of gold and we're pegging it at 800 or you could say that you know we can inflate a lot more paper until we get into trouble we could double the money supply and still cover ourselves with gold so that didn't happen obviously yes it was a one-day event but gold hung in there pretty well well china's having massive problems because the productive capacity of china at this point is uh, has too much uh, capacity. There's not enough demand. Mm -hmm. So, and they have a huge debt problems and 30% of their economy is built on real estate. And these big real estate uh, firms are blowing up. And so they're really in a very, very precarious situation. The banking sector hasn't reflected the amount of pain that's in the real estate sector, but it will. So, you know, if you're going to base your bricks on, you know, all these countries that recently joined, and of course, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, and one of your stalwarts, China, which is the second largest largest economy in the world going down the tubes. How's that going to work? It's not. It's not going to work. Now, the part that does work is inter-exchange between their own currencies. So you can trade Brazilian currency for Chinese currency, Chinese currency for Russian rubles, Russian rubles for South African rand, South African rand for, you know, whatever pesos. And that's fine. And that, that alleviates them having to go through the dollar, which is good for those countries. The problem is that even though it's a, a unified currency, it's just like the euro because they have different cultures, they have different 
different work ethics, they have different holidays, they have different productive capacities. And because of that, if you are, let's say, a Greece in the Euro and you're a Germany in the Euro, who's getting a better deal? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you could think about it, but <laughs> they're not the same. And that's the problem. So you've got problem, you've got a country that, let's say, uses their peso to buy your rubles. And the productive capacity of the peso is not the same as the ruble, then uh, how valid is it? You know, the reason that the U.S. dollar is the you know best shirt in a hamper, as this overused yeah. expression is, because mm -hmm. all these other countries are inflating faster. We're inflating like, like hell won't have it. Uh -huh. But when you consider what Zimbabwe did with their inflation <laughs> compared to the dollar, the dollar is a real king. Or the lira, or, you know, Turkish lira or whatever. So, right. and is that true, David, in every case? No, it's not. But that's the way the index reacts, is that these other currencies are devaluing faster than the dollar. Yeah. And because of that fact, the dollar looks better than the rest of them. Not because we aren't destroying the dollar. Mm -hmm. Just destroying it at a lower rate. And of course, the main reason, as we all know, that probably should be said is because we do have the luxury of being the reserve currency, yeah. which is being diminished by the BRICS. But the BRICS currency taking over, it's not going to happen, at least not for a long, long time, in my view. And I'll change my mind. I get better data or something appears that I've missed. But these dollar debts are bad. They're dollar denominated. So if you're in Indonesia or you know any country that has dollar denominated debt, You've got to take those ruples or those pesos or whatever your currency is, convert them to dollars to pay off the dollar debt. You cannot pay your dollar debt off with the RICS currency. It can't be done.